Dr. Claire Gray. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for uh, inviting me to come. It's always a pleasure to, to speak with you. We started, I think, back uh, a couple of years ago and had uh, several town halls. And uh, thank you all for giving up uh, evening your time. And I've been doing a lot of speaking. It's always interesting. There's Sometimes I show up in tennis and jeans and a sport coat, and everybody else comes in a suit and a tie. Tonight, I came in a suit and a tie. Everybody else is in jeans and tennis. So. I get it right most of the time, but sometimes I'm just a little off. But it's a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you. It's interesting listening to Dan when he was starting talking about the uh, essential nature of property rights to freedom. And in my book, The Battle for America's Soul, I think Patsy and Caitlin handed out little uh, bookmarks. I, in my opening chapter, I actually used property rights to help frame the issue. I start with health care, and I'll get that, uh, to that in just a moment with the story of Barbara Wagner. And then I pivot to the story of Suzette Kilo. How many here know of Suzette Kilo? Yeah, Kilo v. New London, property rights eminent domain. This is exactly the same thing. What's happening in healthcare, with the breakdown of the rule of law, is happening in property rights, it's happening in education, it's happening in foreign policy, and we're watching it possibly play on the Supreme Court, we certainly have in the past, and it's happening in postmodern politics. These are all just different sides, different faces of the same process. So I'm going to briefly talk about uh, healthcare. And I have a pointer that usually kind of runs this for me, but the, for whatever reason tonight it's not working, so I'll graciously offer it to, to help. So with the, uh, the first slide, I'm just going to talk about a couple of things to frame this health care issue. First is our national debt, you know, $10.7 trillion. When you take our, our total combined debt, every time I present, I have to change this slide. You know, it's going up almost, you know, a billion dollars every time I give this talk. Now it stands at just over $15.6 trillion. Slide. And uh, interest on this debt, I don't think the, the common person, the average person, this is a bright group, you probably all get it, understands what this, this number means. So right now we're at a sort of historically low interest rates in the country, about two and a quarter percent. So right now we're paying somewhere on the order of $240 billion a year. Historically it's between 5 and 6 percent, which gives us between three, $535 billion, and next slide, $642 billion. Now the CBO has projected our debt is going to nearly double over the next decade. So we are looking at, if interest rates go back to their historical norm, we're looking at paying over a trillion dollars a year just in interest on our debt. That's astronomical. Just in 2010, Medicare was uh, 524 billion, and Medicaid is about 427 billion. So when we're looking at interest on our debt, it could easily overtake what we're spending on Medicare and Medicaid. And as we talk about the financial future, you know, we have Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. These public entitlements are drowning us in debt. What it means is we will become enslaved to our debt. It's interesting, I was asked to write a piece for the Wall Street Journal uh, a couple months back about the meltdown of the euro. And what I saw behind that, and maybe you all get to this in just a bit, but there's conversations now of this sort of super league of nations forgiving, forgiving uh, countries like Greece and Portugal and Spain, their debt, if that country is willing to cede fiscal sovereignty. Now, how do you bring down the United States? You know, put us $20 trillion in the hole where we can't sustain our debt. So something has to be done about the kind of money we're spending. And I'm going to pair this, seems different, but this, this all, all ties together. So a recent survey, this is uh, released at the end of February, Oh, no, sorry, this is uh, just out of that slide. So here's a, a comparison of the debt between the U.S. and Europe. The total European debt is less than what America has. And if you look at a per capita basis, we have fewer people than they do, which makes our combined per capita debt greater than that of Europe. 
So as we're watching a Europe meltdown, we're standing right next to them. So let's frame this all in another context. There's a survey released on um, February 29th. is asking physicians what do they think about this uh, patient protection affordable care act. And one of the questions they asked is, is healthcare reform likely to lead you to retire over the next five years? Top line, very likely 23.7%, somewhat likely 19.2%. Just over 40% of physicians said they are very or somewhat likely to leave medicine in the next five years because of Obamacare, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. There's another question asked, are you willing to recommend health care as a profession? And it used to be physicians wanted their kids to go into medicine. It was looked at as a, as a great profession. And I think, Dan, you would agree with me, it still is and has the potential to be a great profession. But most physicians are saying, you know, don't, don't go into it. A lot of the docs I know are asking, how can I escape? Now let's start to combine these two things. So what does our national debt and the fact that physicians are leaving medicine mean for the patient-physician relationship? So because as we're running out of money as a nation, as a federal government, we're starting to impose more and more restrictions on the physicians pushing them out of medicine, and especially in Medicare. Now a lot of seniors as they approach retirement are having a difficult time finding a physician. So we're going to have to start to grapple with these. So this is a story about Barbara Wagner, her picture. How many have heard Barbara Wagner? A handful of you. So she's a 64-year-old gal that uh, lived in Oregon, didn't have insurance, and uh, the state of Oregon was struggling with the issue of the uninsured, just like every state in the country. So they instituted what was called the Oregon Health Plan. It's a statement plan designed to take care of those that didn't have insurance. Well, Barbara had recurrent lung cancer when saw her oncologist. He prescribed Tarceva, a new chemotherapy. So she went to get her chemotherapy, and instead of being able to get her medication, she got a letter from the state of Oregon saying, we won't pay for your chemotherapy, but we will pay for hospice or for physician-assisted suicide. <laughs> And you can see the picture. Here she is, petting a dog. It looks like she's ready to go bake cookies. She's a viable 64-year-old gal. Yeah, she's sick. Absolutely, she has recurrent lung cancer. But I'm trying to think how, if she was my patient and came to me as a relatively calm, thoughtful physician, how would I thoughtfully and calmly explain to her that um, government compassion sounds so noble but in the end, whoever pays holds the power to choose. And they were essentially replacing her chance to live with a choice of how to die. And how do I explain that to my patient? Let me back up and repeat that one line. Government compassion sounds so noble, but in the end, whoever pays holds the power to choose. And as we saw in the first couple of slides, the government can't pay anymore. They're broke. So what do we do? And if we follow this path to ceding power, watching our tax dollars go to Washington, and then being held to their mandates as they so graciously send it back, we're losing control. So there's a, another story, and I'll keep this one short, a uh, book I read back in the mid-1990s, um, Peter, Peter Singer's Rethinking Life and Death. He was proposing the concept of infanticide, where we would take the lives of our kids born with disabilities, because it would be so much more cost effective. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have to raise kids with disabilities, we could take that money we'd save, invest it in kids that are much more gifted. And I was wondering, how does one of our leading bioethicists seriously propose reinstituting infanticide as a way of dealing with rising cost of health care? Turns out, Peter Singer's infanticide, and Barbara Wagner's euthanasia are very, very closely related. So to answer this question of how we got here as a nation, I went back and read some 60 or 70,000 pages of history and philosophy. The next few minutes I'm going to tell you the story of what I found. And it very, very clearly defines this issue of what it means to have individual rights where we the people give power to government. Government doesn't give liberty to we the people. And that's really the fundamental choice that we're facing as a nation. 
The story actually begins back in ancient Greece with two great thinkers, Plato and Hippocrates. Plato was born about uh, 427 BC, Hippocrates is born about 460. But their thinking sort of frames two polar opposite ways of approaching uh, healthcare. Two very different ways of what it means to be a patient, two very different ways of what it means to be a physician. That's the debate we're having now. In Plato's Republic, he talks about the role of the physician. He says, but bodies that disease has penetrated through and through, the physician would not have attempted to cure. He did not, he being the physician, did not want to lengthen all good for nothing lives, or to have weak fathers beginning weaker sons. If a man was not able to live in the ordinary way, he being the physician had no business to cure him. For such a cure would have been either no use to himself, put away my pointer, or those last four words, or to the state. So here we see back in ancient Greece, the concept of Plato's introducing is the role of the physician to look out for the welfare of the state, not the good of the individual patient. Next slide. Plato goes on. But these practices will treat the bodies and minds of your citizens who are naturally well endowed. As for the rest, those with poor physical constitution will be allowed to die. And you have to love the poetry of Plato. And those with irredeemably rotten minds will be put to death. So in some ways, it's kind of funny the way Plato phrases this. But think about it. The role of the physician is to look out for the young, the strong, the fit, those that are moving culture forward, the good of the collective. He's also responsible for looking out those that are a burden on society, the elderly, the weak, the sick, the infirm, neither kill them or let them die. 